Now I'm going to introduce our final speaker before the final Q&A. This is Dr. Andrew Hirons, who's Senior Lecturer in Arboriculture and Urban Forestry at the University Centre in Myerscough in uh, the UK. Um, Andrew is, uh, is involved in higher education teaching and also on uh, tree biology, tree establishment and urban tree management. And he's also actively involved in research. Uh, primarily, this research is motivated by the need to create resilient urban forests that meet the needs of society. He has particular expertise in species selection and he's published a number of papers evaluating how functional plant traits can better inform tree selection for urban environments. Well, we're very pleased to have Andrew with us for the final presentation before the Q&A, and we look forward to his presentation now. Thank you. Well, hello, my name's Andy Hirons, and I'm going to talk to you for the next uh, 15 minutes about the science of tree selection. And it's a great privilege to be able to contribute to this Green City Conference. If you consider the urban forest as a sort of you know, general population of trees within the urban environment that's made up of street trees and park trees, those trees in gardens and in verges and so on, then inevitably some of them will be performing rather poorly. So you might say that they've gone through a poor performance threshold, and that, that could be related to the soil volume, the particular rooting environment, uh, or even the above ground environment that has led to that sort of drop in performance. But I think we have a number of strategic challenges. It means that much more of the urban forest is going to be under pressure. And the first, of, of course, is climate change. That's going to really cause problems for some of our established trees within the urban forest. And the other major element, uh, which I won't unfortunately have time to really talk about today, is the accelerated migration of pests and pathogens. This is going to put an awful lot of pressure, potentially at least, on our urban trees and our treescapes more generally. And the effect of those two major pressures is that much of the urban forest will be sort of driven through that poor performance threshold and likely through a tree mortality threshold. And, and so really we need to be very careful about how we plan and move forward. And I think that species diversity is really critical to these challenges. And of course, with species diversity comes species selection. So if we just unpack that a little bit more, at least in the UK, our future projections in the summer, 2060 to 2079, this this figure or these figures show, is that those summer conditions are likely to be warmer and they're likely to be drier. And I think that's quite similar for a lot of Northwestern Europe. And of course, there are lots and lots of papers out there discussing climate. This is just one that caught my eye recently. Um, and it says, I'm just gonna just quote uh, from the some of the conclusions. As a general trend, we found that all cities tend to shift towards the subtropics with the cities from the northern hemisphere shifting to warmer conditions on average around a thousand kilometers south at a velocity of around 20 kilometers a year and cities from the tropics shifting to drier conditions and they predict that madrid's climate in 2050 will resemble marrakesh's climate today stockholm will res resemble budapest london will shift to barcelona moscow to sofia seattle to san francisco and tokyo to shangsha so, you know, we've got some real challenges ahead as our climate shift and our climate shift towards those warmer, drier conditions. So one of those strategic questions we might ask ourselves then as scientists is how can we actually select for drought tolerance? Of course, we can consult the literature and there's all sorts of uh, books on trees uh, and plant use out there that you might want to engage with. But the challenge is when we engage with that literature, actually often it's rather conflicting in its advice. And so I take here Asa Nagundo as an example. You know, we've got one author that says, well, it's useful for sandy, dry to sterile soil. 
another that says it's drought tolerant. Its native habitat is along streams and ponds. Well, that's perhaps in conflict to the previous authors. This is uh, one that I, <laughs> I really think sits on the fence. It's native in moist habitats, but performs well also in poor, wet or dry habitats. Well, you wonder what do you do with uh, some advice like that as a plant user? Really, it doesn't give you any direction as to, to where this species might be best deployed. Other, other authors say it's very heat and drought tolerant. Grows a, another one says grows along shores of permanent bodies of water, likes humid areas, grows along stream banks, floodplains and swamps. So really, it's a challenge, isn't it, as a landscape architect or a landscape designer, even perhaps as a as a grower to make sensible recommendations when you engage with the literature that's out there. And I just chose Asia Nagunda as an example. There are many, many other examples that will give you a similar sort of, uh, you know, cause for confusion. I think one of the most promising opportunities is to engage with some of the science, uh, ecosystem science, and uh, particularly the plant trait uh, science that I think will really help to improve our selection decisions. And, and when we think about trait-based assessments, really that's only uh, a general term for a, a quantifiable characteristic that reveals something of the tree's personality. I'm sort of paraphrasing from the from the scientific literature, but you get the point. We've got to be able to quantify it, but it also has to reveal something uh, we might say functional, if you like, about about the plant. And in terms of drought tolerance, there's a couple that are really uh, important traits. One is the leaf turgor loss point. Sometimes you see that referred to as the permanent wilting point. And the second is uh, the stem water potential at 50% loss of hydraulic conductivity. And both of those traits allow species to be uh, compared and contrasted uh, that, that uh, perhaps grow across uh, precipitation gradients in slightly different climates and, and, and even uh, within the same climate. So they're two quantifiable traits that we can measure, that we can assess through experimentation uh, and through science, scientific evaluation of, of plant collections in order to give us some guidance. And I just want to really unpack some of our own experience uh, within the group of researchers that I work with of using the leaf turga loss. So this leaf turga loss point, it can be used as, as a universal measure of physiological drought tolerance that's quantifiable and measurable and that's uh, quite a well-established thing in the literature if you're interested in some of the background literature please do get in touch one of the first uh, evaluations that uh, my colleague uh, Henrik Harman and Nina Basic and I did uh, several years ago now was to look at the drought tolerance in ASA and Henrik was doing his postdoctoral work with Nina Basak at Cornell University. And Cornell had a particular, uh, particularly good collection of maples. And so we evaluated quite a wide range of, of maples from around the botanical collection at Cornell University. And you'll see here by this figure that we have quite a wide range of turga loss points. And I'll just uh, describe that figure a little bit more deeply in a little bit more detail the, the dark the black bars represent a spring measurement and the uh, gray bars represent a summer measurement and we've ranked the species according to their summer turga loss point and the more negative the turga loss point the more drought tolerant the plant and so you can see there's quite a lot of variation there ranging from um, a greater value than minus two to a more negative value than minus four, and that's really substantially, uh, you know, important. That sort of range is really, really significant in terms of, in terms of plants. And so, we take Asa spicatum, for example, that grows here in the understory, rather humid, cool, shady conditions, and we found that the turga loss point was uh, minus one point six megapascals. That's really quite high. So sensitive to drought. 
And another species, again, this is just an image of its natural habitat. It was taken, the, the, the uh, evaluation was done at Cornell University. But this Asa tricatum is, again, an understory maple species. So cool, uh, humid, rather cloudy, uh, shady habitat. And it had a turgor loss point of minus 2.4 megapascals. Well, we contrast that with something like Asa tectaricum, which grows in the steppe forest of eastern Romania in its natural habitat, and it's around minus uh, 3.6 megapascals. Asa grandidentatum, this is uh, on, on the west coast of the Rockies, and uh, it was found to be minus 3.8 megapascals. And in fact, Asa monopesilanum uh, was even more drought tolerant than that at uh, beyond minus 4 megapascals. And so we got really good evidence that we could predict, even within the same botanic collection, that there was variation in maples uh, according to their turgor loss point and therefore their, their drought tolerance. And, and that was uh, really quite an interesting finding for us as, as, as academics, if you like, that are interested in the science of, of selection. The other interesting thing is that we could pick out differences across cultivars. And this is potentially really important for horticultural purposes. And so that we see here in these two species, Asa sulcarum, so sugar maple, and Asa rubrum, red maple, we see that Green Mountain and Northwood are the most drought tolerant of those cultivars that we tested. And really interestingly is that we know that those two cultivars are from the westernmost range of the species. In other words, they're the, in the driest portion of the range in terms of their, their uh, provenance and their ecotypes. So that was really interesting that we were able to find that cultivar level um, discrimination, if you like, between, between the different plant groups. And so if we took something like this urban planting bed in Ithaca, which is obviously highly constrained soil volume, and we took our conceptual ideas around turgor loss point and said, well, okay, these species that have a high turgor loss point, if we try and put them in that sort of scenario, they're just going to fail. Actually, much better to say that those species with a more negative turgor loss point are inherently much more tolerant to low water potential. And they're likely to perform much better in some of those really constrained conditions. I'm not saying those particular species, but as a concept, as an idea, um, we need to be thinking about putting species with uh, much lower, more negative turgor loss into those most challenging of conditions. And so we have um, probably over the last five, six, seven years, I forget how long now, have done over 200 um, species. And that's enabled us to really, if you like, put some quantitative data around around the, the guidance that we, we issue. And so we, we, we made made the decision to say, well, okay, anything higher than uh, minus 2.5 megapascals is sensitive between minus 2.5 and three megapascals is moderately sensitive to drought. Minus uh, three to minus uh, 3.5 is moderately tolerant to drought. And anything with a turgor loss uh, more negative than minus 3.5, we're considering to be tolerant to drought. And so, Although uh, in the guidance that I'll, I'll just uh, outline very briefly shortly, we can see that um, the qualitative terms that we use in the guidance is actually underpinned insofar as possible with some quantitative data. One of the other things that I think is, is interesting is that we, we, we kind of try to uh, ground truth our, our research, if you like, and we did find that practitioner experience uh, was closely related to what we could determine through a drought um, trait analysis. So that was a really important for us. So in other words, you know, we could anticipate the experience as that practitioners may get uh, with, with this sort of data. And uh, that, that relationship was highly significant. Well, we've gone on and uh, we've recently provided analysis that looked at a, a, the general level and we found, you know, um, that they, of course, uh, would differ quite widely as well. With uh, Groups like magnolia and birches coming out as much, much more sensitive to drought than some of the maples and, and oaks. So 
Um, that was uh, well worth looking at if you're interested and, and it also relates to ecological observations. Lots of this work has been condensed and uh, put out uh, through a guide that Henrik Farman and myself wrote on behalf of the Trees and Design Action Group and that is available for free. Um, it's downloadable from the, the TDAG website and contains around 280 species profiles uh, with things like their use potential and for example the paved environment all of those species that we're recommending for a paved environment has uh, at least a moderate tolerance to drought uh, which of course you've now got some understanding as to how we we reached that conclusion and we got uh, of course tree crown and size characteristics uh, as you might expect and form and, and density ornamental characteristics and then other information as well and so we, we think of the issues to be aware of if there's a allergenicity issue or something like that we have uh, notable varieties and, and so on um, so that is um, a really important uh, resource for many many people and then finally then there's just this um, tree selector and uh, supplementary database that's part part of that whole package that you can download. Finally then, although I'm 30 seconds over time, I'd just like to say that tree selection is only one aspect of really securing tree establishment and we haven't got time to explore all of them but of course plant quality is really really important, the rooting environment uh, essential and the fundamental of boricultural practice of planting and providing aftercare is also really, really important. So thanks for your time. It's been a really quick presentation. I hope that you got something from it and I look forward and welcome your questions shortly.